All right, hello everyone. I'm John Vandermosten, biotech analyst at Zacks, and I cover 10X Therapeutics and have a $4.50 price target on the company. Uh, we've liked them for some time, and it's one of our best ideas. Uh, the company is sponsoring two phase three uh, ready drugs in pulmonary hypertension. The first candidate, levosimindin, has been used for decades in Europe uh, for patients with heart failure. Uh, while the product was approved long ago in uh, many other geographies, it's not yet approved in the United States. Uh, the second uh, recently added candidate is well known in the oncology world, uh, Gleevec, also known as imatinib in generic terms. It was approved 20 years ago for leukemia. And in addition to curing cancer, Gleevec or imatinib um, it has, the, has demonstrated the ability to block and reverse excessive cell growth in pulmonary artery smooth muscle. So in contrast to the approved treatments for pH that only treat symptoms, imatinib may be a disease modifying therapy that can reverse the advance of the disease. Uh, we've also got new executives at the company that I'd like to introduce to everyone. Uh, Chris Giordano, CEO, uh, he just started a few weeks ago and uh, Dr. Stuart Rich, uh, Chief Medical Officer, he came on board earlier in 2021, although he's been with the company for uh, some time as a consultant. Um, why don't you both give us an introduction to yourself? Chris, uh, you first, tell us uh, some of your background and how you got here. Sure. Thank you. Um, so I'm Chris Giordano. I joined in July of 2021. Um, 10X is headquartered here in North Carolina, where I've lived for a little over 20 years. Uh, my background's in clinical development. I spent uh, the last 20 years at PPD and then quintiles, um, later IQVIA, um, much of it in cardiovascular drug development, but working across uh, a range of, of therapeutic areas in uh, project management, clinical operations, um, various roles uh, like that. I'm, the, I'm less interesting than Stuart though. So you, it's good of you to get me out of the way, John. All right, Dr. Rich, let's hear about you. Thank you, John. So I'm Stuart Rich. Um, I am an academic cardiologist uh, who has been in this space for 40 years. Um, I started by um, creating the very first registry in the world on pulmonary hypertension from an NIH grant in 1980 and have been involved in the drug development of PAH over the, the last 40 years um, in some form or another. Um, and so um, I uh, started at the pursuit of a matinib, which we'll talk about a little more shortly for PAH when I met 10X and um, suggested to them that levosimendin, their drug, might also be effective for a different form of pulmonary hypertension, um, merged my little biotech company with theirs at the first of the year. And now we've got two um, late stage assets ready for phase three trials for next year that we're very excited about. Great, great. That's, that's very exciting. And that's exactly what we're gonna start talking about right now. And you know, I wanna get some background on the pulmonary hypertension market. Um, there are a few different categories here. Uh, the World Health Organization has, has broken it up into several different uh, segments. Um, what, what are these categories and how are they all different and which ones right now have treatment? So there are five groups uh, uh, created by World Health Organization, actually in a, in a, in a committee uh, meeting that Stuart was a, a part of many years ago. So there are five groups of pulmonary hypertension. Our drugs are being tested in patients uh, in group one, um, pulmonary arterial hypertension, that's the imatinib um, uh, pursuit. In group two, which is pulmonary hypertension um, from left heart disease, um, there is group three is pulmonary hypertension associated with other lung disease. Um, and then there's CTEF, chronic uh, thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. Um, and then there's a final basket category of, of, of pH secondary to other diseases, uh, for example, sickle cell, um, um, sarcoidosis, a few, other, a few other diseases that lead to pH. So um, there's one drug, Reosiguat, approved in both group three uh, for patients who can't deal with the chronic clotting that occurs in that disease um, with surgery. Um, it's also approved in, in patients with PAH. Um, <clears throat> antithrombotic therapies are used in these patients for the same reason. They're not uh, approved on that basis, but they're in the guidelines. Um, most of the drug development work that has occurred, and it's, there has been a lot of uh, approval uh, success in the last 15 years or so, is with vasodilators in group one only, which is a, a very small group of patients. It's an orphan population population. Um, pulmonary arterial hypertension. So 
Um, uh, many physicians are familiar with Flolan or epoprostenol. This was one of the first drugs approved in this area. Um, Triprostenil, Bosentin, there are other um, ERAs in that class with Bosentin, um, Iloprost, um, Sildenafil and Tadalafil under different names like Rivadio are, uh, are approved. Um, and then in, in other forms um, uh, of the disease, calcium channel blockers have been used for a very long time, never an approval there, but a lot of um, guidance around their use from before the time that all of these vasodilators were, um, were approved. Uh, so Stuart's a world expert on this stuff uh, and can certainly comment on, on that history as well. Um, yeah, so um, it, it's been a long journey. The uh, drugs were developed in the beginning because of the concept that pulmonary vasoconstriction, uh, constriction of the pulmonary arteries was the underlying cause of the disease. So these drugs are all considered pulmonary vasodilators. Uh, the science now shows that vasoconstriction is only a major player in about 10% of the patients. And so most of these patients don't have much of a change in the severity of their pulmonary hypertension. What the drugs have shown to do, though, is give them some symptom relief, modest lowering of the pulmonary pressure, ability to walk a little farther and live a little bit quality of life. But it's still progressive and fatal uh, because none of the existing therapies either halt progression or cause reversal of the disease process. And that's why there still is this high unmet medical need for an effective therapy in this group of patients. Exactly. And, you know, Chris, you, you named a lot of the, the, the leading uh, pharmaceuticals out there for PAH. Uh, and I did some work and digging, and there's about $6 billion in revenues generated in uh, 2020. Um, and it's dominated by J&J &J and United Therapeutics. I thought I'd add that on there. Uh, they have about four or five of the top, uh, the top six drugs or something like that. Um, and, you know, I wanted to comment on the size, perhaps, of the group one versus the group two, where you're working with Levis and Minden. Uh, and just compare, you know, how big each of those groups is, because I think it's, you know, when you think of that $6 billion figure, um, you know, on this small orphan group, you know, how big could that be for, you know, group two where Levis and Minden may, may make some waves? Mm -hmm. So the, in terms of the population, you know, in the U.S., the different companies and different data sources uh, published and otherwise estimate between 30 and 50,000. We've even seen sort of 55,000 patients. Um, with PAH diagnoses, we're, we're not sure it's quite that high, but it's a it's a rare disease by you know by by any standard. In Europe, there might be as many. I think it's uh, again we've seen kind of forty thousand. Um, in Japan, some experts we've spoken to have argued whether it's two to three thousand or three to three and a half thousand. Uh, so <laughs> there's not not a huge uh, range there, but plenty of debate. But uh, you know, rare rare. Um, but rare globally, um, you know, gro globally prevalent at the same rate. Um, and it is true that the, the, the sales estimates for a global group, if you look at, let's say, the top eight countries, um, and you think about 40,000 Americans, 6 billion in, in sales is, is an astonishing commitment um, that yeah. the orphan legislation has led to, um, it, which, has been, which has been great for these patients. Um, in, in group two, um, while uh, it's, 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 it's less clear, it's a much larger population. We think probably a million and a half in the U.S. who are suffering from um, pulmonary hypertension associated with left heart disease. And um, these are primarily patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Um, there are other, other types of left heart disease, but that's the, or contributing factors, but that's the, the primary group, a much uh, both are increasing in prevalence every year. These patients are in both groups are living a little longer. Um, um, and in, in the case of HEFPEF in particular, the total number of heart failure diagnoses made up of patients with preserved ejection fraction is increasing. Um, our, our product is focused on pulmonary hypertension, patients with that, with that type of disease who have pulmonary hypertension as well. Okay. So, so if you think about that, uh, that group of perhaps 50,000 that generates, you know, 6 billion in revenues, what does that mean the opportunity could be for, um, you know, group two, with, which has maybe 20 times the size? I mean, obviously it's not an orphan indication, but, um, you know, what, what, what do you think that means? The yeah, I see, you know, you know, when you, when you just think about the annual reimbursement for a product, obviously much, much lower dollar value, um, 
but we think you know we could we could foresee um, you know a very high percentage of those patients um, uh, given that there's nothing available for them today despite numerous attempts um, to prove the benefit of drugs that treat just pulmonary hypertension or just um, heart failure. There's, there's nothing for those patients. So right. a huge opportunity there in terms of a kind of a totally underserved um, uh, population. Um, with, with imatinib, our hope is that, um, you know, we, we might, I think it's reasonable to target 20% of that existing market. You, you wouldn't necessarily um, kick a patient off a vasodilator to put them on imatinib, right? Um, it's not it's not competing in that sense. It might be complementary in some patients. There's a lot of work to do and a lot of field use to do, I think, to really determine that. But it's it's a if it's successful, it will be successful as a disease modifying agent in a group of patients who have nothing but vasodilation right now. So pretty reasonable, I think, modest maybe to say you know one in five of those patients would um, would benefit in a market analysis. Okay. Yeah, it sounds like that uh, for matinib, uh, it, it will complement rather than displace the current uh, the current uh, drugs in the. In the well, but let, let me just add to that, um, John, because there are some anecdotal uh, papers published out of Europe where they've used some off-label imatinib use in these patients over the years, and the ones who respond with their disease reversal, they have found that they no longer need the pulmonary mm -hmm. basal dilators and have withdrawn them, and so in the biggest picture it may end up being a cost savings for these patients because instead of taking two, three, and four drugs, they can take two or one drug and do well. Yeah, yeah, it's exciting opportunity. Can't wait to see how, how that turns out. So um, let's let's talk about levosimine in, in particular for, for a little bit. Um, this this is a drug that the, the 10X has been developing for a while, uh, and, and now the indication is pulmonary hypertension, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, or pH hef hef, as as we want to say, um, there, um, as we said, there are no therapies for group two pulmonary hypertension, but levosimidin appears to address the underlying problem. And, and Dr. Rich, can you, can you share with us the, um, the mechanism of action of the drug? Uh, I, 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 when I was putting together our report on the company, I pointed out the uh, inotropic and lusotropic effects. Can you explain what those are and you know, why this sure. works in that, okay. uh, in that group? So um, first of all, I'm going to refer to it as pulmonary hypertension left heart disease, simply because people get so confused with those letters and peps and peps <laughs> and things like that. But we're talking about the same entity. So yeah. um, the, the, what we did is made a discovery with levosimendin. Levosimendin, as you just mentioned, has been approved in Europe as an inotropic drug. That, that's a drug like epinephrine, adrenaline, noradrenaline, et cetera, drugs that are given in cardiogenic shock to sustain your blood pressure and to keep your heart functioning uh, in a very sick disease state. And levosimendin was introduced back 20 years ago as another one of these inotropic drugs they thought was safer, a better safety profile, better uh, tolerated for the same indication. And that's what they were approved for in Europe. It's for what we call acute decompensated heart failure. It's given intravenously only typically five days while you're in intensive care in the hospital. But that drug has its pleiotropic effects. It has effects much beyond this. And one of those effects is called potassium channel activation. So without getting too technical, um, the potassium channels regulate all of the blood vessels in your body. Um, and when they downregulate, you get trouble. You, get you have disease states, including heart failure and pulmonary hypertension. When you can activate them, you can reverse that. And that is the property of levosimendin that we are focusing on because when I uh, started to work with 10X about developing this drug, it was not in the traditional way of another inotropic drug to be given intravenously in the hospital uh, because I, I saw information in published reports over the years that suggested there may be a better opportunity. And that's exactly what we found. And so what it's doing in the pulmonary hypertension patients with left heart disease is it's dilating the venous blood vessels that control blood flow to the heart. It's a, a, an aspect of heart failure that has been known about 
for 40 years and never, never addressed. And so all of the existing therapies um, that have been approved have been tried in this pulmonary hypertension left heart disease group and have failed. There's been over 14 trials with all of these drugs and they fail because they think it's an arterial disease and think about blood pressure and squeezing. But recent science has validated that if you can control the blood flow to the heart, you can bring the pressures down in the lungs and in the heart. And that's exactly what we found in our phase two trial. Right, yeah, and you brought up the phase two trial. You, you recently completed that and it was very successful. M maybe you can share with us some of the findings there. The, the six minute walk test was a, a very important uh, right. endpoint there that, that was also successful. So it was a mechanistic trial and in all transparency, we had true equipoise. We, weren't, we didn't know if it would work. I thought it would work, uh, but we needed to prove it. So we, we made the decision to do a very challenging study that would truly test the mechanism of action that I just described. And so the patients in that trial started by, by having a right heart cath where a catheter is put into their neck veins when they lay on the table at rest and then make them ride a bicycle on the table because we know that drives the pressures up. And after we measured those pressures, they went into the hospital for one night, received a 24 hour infusion of levocimendin, came back the next day for the same test again to see what changed. Uh, because we knew that the most difficult target in this heart disease is lowering this pulmonary venous pressure with exercise. And 24 hours later, I saw dramatic reductions in that. And, 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 and dramatic, and I'm not overstating it, I tend to at times, but not this time. It, it was really kind of amazing. But you can't approve your drug based on the hemodynamics. You have to get it approved based on its use you know, on some measurable uh, cl clinical parameter, such as exercise, six minute walk. So we then had them go home and get weekly infusions of this at home uh, through an IV line and then return six, minute lay, uh, six uh, weeks later to repeat the heart cath and to repeat a six minute walk test. Um, the heart cath to, to demonstrate that those changes in pressures we saw early on were per persistent, which they were, and the six minute walk to see if we could get an endpoint that the FDA would agree to. And bingo, we were the very first drug ever to show an improvement in six minute walk in this horrible disease. Yeah, yeah, impressive. And you know, you mentioned uh, infusion uh, as as the, the the administration method uh, for the phase two, but you're actually going to going to switch that up for phase three, aren't you? And maybe you can talk us through how how you got there. So the intravenous formulation is what's been approved in Europe, um, and we licensed this drug from a European pharmaceutical company called Orion. They also have an oral formulation which they have not released in Europe. Um, but when they saw the results of this trial, they now leased, uh, licensed us the oral formulation mm -hmm. because the oral formulation obviously is going to be easier to take. So what we're doing at the moment is a transition study because we have an open label phase where these patients are still getting weekly uh, infusions of the IV form and transitioning them to the oral form so that we know what dose will be the similar dose from the IV. That's almost done now. And once we know the oral dose, that's what we'll use when we go into our phase three trial. And we have agreement from FDA that we can use the oral dose for a single trial. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that'll really simplify things, not only for the administration of the trial, but also for the patients, you know, assuming you get totally. approved, it's totally. so much easier to, to just take a pill rather than to go into the hospital for an infusion, right? So this yeah. really, really improves dramatically the, uh, you know, the end, the end product. Um, I just would, uh, a quick comment, John, it's, it, it, we definitely will improve patient convenience. Um, these patients had to essentially spend a day hooked up every week in that trial. And, and whilst, you know, many of them, uh, most of them proceeded into the open label extension, um, it, it, it led to two years of therapy that way before they switched to oral in some cases. Everybody was on at least a year. So 52, over 100 weeks of kind of, as I think about it, kind of all day Monday hooked up right? Uh, and right. now they're transitioning to a pill a day. So it, it does say something we think about the, 
um, the, the patient need as well as we hope the benefit that they're feeling. That's part of the part of the approach here is that um, these are patients for whom symptom relief and their own assessment of symptom relief is a huge uh, and very meaningful endpoint. And, and um, to have folks who are willing to go through that and, and who report that after four or five days, they can see the drug effect has mm -hmm. been starting to diminish yeah. and that they're ready to do it again. You would think in a lot of trials, these patients would just drop. They would, you know, they would just wrap up their, their treatment if they weren't feeling a real benefit. So that's, it's encouraging to us, but obviously to be able to take a, a, a two or three pills a day, for example, as opposed to that, it's just a massive difference. Yeah, they must be really, really happy. I bet anecdotally, there's a lot of comments there on how they appreciate the change, no doubt. Um, well, so so that gets us prepared, um, you know, with, this, with the, the, um, the, the dose ranging study, gets us prepared for the phase three, which we're expecting to come up next year. Maybe you can give, a, give us a few, um, a few uh, thoughts on how that's shaping up, when it might happen uh, before we get into a matinib. All right. Um, in terms of the uh, trial that we're, we're planning, we, we really need to get the final patients um, kind of dose settled in that transition to oral therapy. Um, do a bit of observation. It's open label. So we're observing all the time, but we kind of need to do a, turn that observation into analysis and write it up and it will help us with dose selection for the phase three. Um, then a matter of um, some continuing discussions with the FDA about the size. Um, I think the discussion of the, the trial size is within a pretty narrow range, but until it's final, it's not final. So we'll, we'll have those discussions on the protocol and um, we want to confirm that we have a protocol that should it generate positive results will be the only protocol we need with the agency and that that discussions underway. Um, you, you know, you mentioned it a little while ago with a, a matinib again, um, you know, a tremendous or maybe Stuart mentioned it, a tremendous expense for governments and other payers. Um, right. um, and, and these diseases themselves, never mind the therapies for PAH are a tremendous expense. So, you know, there is a huge, there is an enormous will within FDA to get products available to patients with unmet need. And obviously that's what we're in the business of. So we, we think that they will get good agreement to, to do a single trial that'll either prove the point or not. And if so, saves us a lot of time overall. Great. Well, let's let's move into Matinib. That's the, the, the new kid on the block. Uh, it was acquired in, uh, in January, I believe. Um, and along with Dr. Rich. Uh, and we just had news uh, a couple days ago that the FDA had cleared the IMD um, and we'll see a PK study starting in a couple weeks, I think, um, to bridge to the phase three. Maybe we can, um, you know, just get out, start off with just some background on imatinib. I mentioned before, you know, it's been approved for quite a while in, in oncology indications. Um, why should it work for um, PAH? So that's a really good question, John. So <clears throat> imatinib was um, considered the greatest breakthrough in cancer therapy uh, because way back when you may have remembered that the treatment of cancer was to give a, a toxic drug that kills cells that um, grow quickly. And hopefully more of them are cancer cells than non-cancer cells. And that's why the side effects of chemotherapy have been so terrible over the decades. This was a discovery that you can block the thing, the factors called growth factors that make the, the cancer cells grow. And by blocking the growth factors, not only does the cancer not spread, it goes away. Mm -hmm. and so that was demonstrated in the year 2000 for leukemia using imatinib. Imatinib blocks four different growth factors uh, and, and those four growth factors are expressed in the different types of cancers. It was discovered in 2005 that uh, one of those growth factors was active in pulmonary hypertension. And so uh, in animal models, we were able to reverse the disease, giving the animals with pulmonary hypertension imatinib. That then uh, was um, the impetus for Novartis, uh, which was manufacturing Gleevec imatinib at the time to agree to pursue an indication for PAH. And mm -hmm. they went through a traditional phase two and a phase three trial drug development kit that the dr drug approved. The drug works. I mean, what, one of the gifts here is that we're not dealing with a drug that we're not sure how, that it works. We know that it works. Not only we know that it works, we know it works better than anything that's out there because we have all of the data from the phase three trial. 
Um, the problem that they incurred in the phase three trial was there was an excessive number of people dropping out. They were dropping out who received imatinib because of the side effects that they were unprepared for, which was not a problem in the cancer trials. Mm -hmm. And uh, FDA and EMA both require Novartis to do a second phase three trial and they declined. The drug was going off patent. They weren't interested any longer. They withdrew the NDA, they, they abandoned the patent and they said, you know, we've done so well at $5 billion a year in cancer, we're, we're happy and we'll move on. Now, I had been working as a consultant with Novartis through this, and I just didn't want to let this go because I didn't have any of my patients on treatments that would reverse the disease. And so that's why I decided to pick this up and start my little company, which then merged with 10X. And so um, uh, uh, by knowing exactly from this phase three trial data that we have, what dose of drug works, what the side effects were, how to avoid all of this, we have redone the trial design to mitigate against the problems and to enrich against the efficacy. And so we think that we have a trial design that will allow us to show it works even better and is better tolerated. So, so um, you know, you mentioned some of the side effects that were limiting in the previous trials that were done. What are, what are you doing to overcome that? I think GI issues are the main, main problem. So the most common was, was, was nausea and vomiting. Um, okay. the, the typical tablet is what we call immediate release. It dissolves rapidly in the stomach when you take mm -hmm. it, but the drug is not absorbed until it gets into the small intestine. And that can be an hour or two that it sits in your stomach until it moves on. And it causes a lot of irritation in the stomach, nausea and vomiting. To address that, we've developed a delayed release formulation with an enteric coat uh, so that when you swallow it, none of the drug gets absorbed in the stomach. And then when it moves to the small intestine, it rapidly dissolves and rapidly gets absorbed. And so that's, that's what's on, being tested as we speak today in a, in a phase one PK trial. Yeah, right, right, exactly. And um, you know, what else do you think you need to get done prior to the start of the phase three? I mean, you got some good news from the FDA. You're, you're working through this study. What, yeah, uh, um, what else do you have to, what are the milestones? Well, so once the PK study is done, which will be done in the month of October, uh, we, we will have to get some of the data from that, the, the drug um, uh, um, uh, concentration data, which may take a month or two. Mm -hmm. um, but then we, we're, we're going to uh, the FDA with our final protocol, because we have agreement already in terms of the synopsis of the protocol. Um, mm -hmm. And then it's a matter of gearing up, scaling up. Uh, I mean, we've, we've got drug manufactured. Uh, we've got on to stability. We're filing all of the requirements that the FDA sets up for, for new drug. And then we plan in the first half of next year to ramp it up and start uh, enrolling in the clinical trial. Okay. Yeah. Sounds exciting. You know, I think, um, I think there's some other companies working on, on, on a matinib and pH. Uh, Aerovate Therapeutics is one and Aramai Therapeutics is another. Are, there, are those a threat to what you're doing? I mean, I, I think with an orphan designation, you know, I mean, the first, first mover advantage is, is pretty clear. How, how, how do you see that shaping up? So they are a threat because the orphan designation will only go to the company that has the first approved trial, the first, first NDA. And so you could say we are in a foot race. Um, I will say that from what we know in the public domain, which is a fair amount, uh, they're only going into phase two with an inhaled formulation that's never been given to a human patient yet. And um, for example, the Aerovate trial uh, has been published. They need to recruit 460 patients into their trial. We maybe need to recruit 60 patients, a fraction of that. So um, you could speculate how far in advance we are, a year, maybe two years, but we are comfortable that we are farther ahead of our competition uh, with respect to starting our trial. We know exactly the dosing that's going to be necessary to get a treatment effect. Um, and we need, we have a strategy to deal with the side effects. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, great. Thanks for, um, thanks for the clarification on those, on those, on those other guys out there. So, you know, I want to wrap up with just taking a look at things longer term. Um, you know, both of these phase three trials, I, I don't know if you've disclosed how long you think they might take. I mean, obviously there are, um, you know, there are, there, there are things that may delay 
the, the completion of the phase three, and, and we don't know, always know how that turns out. But when we, you know, assuming we get approval for both of these, how do you see commercialization working out? Is this something you'll need to do with a partner, or is this something you can do yourself? So with uh, with Levo Cement and um, I don't and I don't think we'll be providing a product to patients before 2025. So it's not the it's not the distant future, but it's not the next two years either. Um, I think with Levo Cement and we have a global partner Orion who originally got the approval of that product in uh, in Europe and then globally through through their. Um, their organization and network. So we will we will commercialize that in the in the U.S. and in Canada um, when the time comes. With Imatinib, I think uh, the search for partners is 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 on. Um, I think for for Europe as well as for Japan and possibly other uh, countries in Asia. Um, you know, we've I think as as Stuart just said it. If um, if the other versions of Imatinib work and they work. Before we prove ours works, it's a you know different. It's a different way of getting a great benefit for patients. Um, inhaled formulation is far from a sure thing. Um, we think our our route is is a bit more dependent on um, the existing efficacy data that Novartis put together years ago. So um, we're we're very optimistic. Um, but we would look to we would look to partner for global commercialization on that product. We. Um, you know, we've, we think we've got a great product. We need to get the data together, and then I think we want partners to to help us um, address a you know a global need. It's a it, you know there's I think you said it earlier, uh, Johnson and Johnson soon Merck uh, possibly you know, not, you know a few years, but certainly United today. There are companies out there that are helping out these patients through the highly specialized physicians who treat them, and I think our our approach would be to. Um, to approach that same pretty select group of, um, of prescribers and, and give them another, another uh, uh, perhaps very strong um, product in their armamentarium. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, great. Thank you so much. Any any final comments on uh, on on ten X or what we expect to see in the future? Or any other things? There's no late breaking news that we can give you this week, John. But <laughs> hang in there, hang in there. We you know follow the story. We got a lot, a lot coming up in the in the end of the year and 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 next year with hopefully the start of both of these trials. So we're we're optimistic and we're basically um, on target with our plan. So that's a good place to be for now. Stuart holds everybody to task. If we slip one day, he just he's not having it. the <laughs> so chairman. Yeah, the chairman okay, comes yeah. out. So all I'll, I'm going to go back to my academic clinical hat and tell you, I can't wait for these drugs. You know, as I say, I've been dealing with this disease for 40 years and dealing with the, the terrible stories of my patients um, dying at young ages and, and living very limited lifestyles. And so, um, so eager to have a, a disease modifying treatment and, and a very effective treatment in these patients that'll change their lives. Um, and that to me is the ultimate reward for our, what we're doing. Yeah, definitely. Well, I definitely see a way forward for uh, both levosimidin and imatinib to uh, you know, meet a, a severe unmet need in pulmonary hypertension. Well, thank you both for your time today. Um, please take a look at, at scr.zax.com and you can find our latest report on 10X Therapeutics and our, our detailed thoughts. And with that, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you for uh, watching us today and look forward to speaking again soon.